Welcome to the next video in the Local Ecosystem Series. This video is looking at the following dot point. Identify examples of allelopathy, parasitism, mutualism and commensalism in an ecosystem and the role of organisms in each type of relationship. So what we have here is a picture of a crocodile and a plover. And the question is, what is the relationship between the, these two animals? Uh, we would normally assume that a crocodile would eat a bird similar to a plover, but in this relationship, they're actually helping each other out. So the crocodile helps the plover by obviously protecting it from its predators, but what the plover actually does is it eats ticks off the crocodile and out of its mouth, which actually forms the main diet of the plover. Now this helps the crocodile as it keeps its mouth nice and clean and stops it from getting infections. Here we have an elephant and some birds. Again, you would assume that there wouldn't really be much of a relationship between these two, but what actually happens is as the elephant moves along the path, it stirs up the ground and the birds are able to eat the bugs that are, um, that are brought to the surface of the dirt. Okay, so the elephant doesn't really have any um, issue with the birds being there, but the birds do benefit from the elephant walking along. Lastly, this relationship is a dog and a tick, which hopefully will be a fairly uh, obvious one. So ticks are what we call parasites. So in this case, the tick is benefiting, but the dog is being harmed uh, in quite a serious way if it's not taken care of fairly quickly. So these are all examples of symbiotic relationships. So symbiosis is when two organisms live together. They can live together either temporarily or it can be for a longer period of time. And in a symbiotic relationship, at least one of the organism benefits from the relationship. So the crocodile and the plover, they both benefited. The birds and the elephants, the bird benefits, and the tick and the dog, the tick was the one that benefited. So as the dot point says, there are four different symbiotic relationships, mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, and allelopathy. And we're going to have a look at each one and a couple of examples. So starting off with mutualism, Mutualism is a relationship which is advantageous or is good to both organisms. It is known as a positive-positive relationship. So it has positive aspects for both individuals within the relationship. So as we said, the plover hunts for ticks on and in the crocodile, which forms the main part of its diet. And the crocodile assists the plover by not attacking it, as well as protecting it from its predators. Another example of mutualism is the clownfish. So if we've all seen Finding Nemo, we'll know that Nemo and his family lived in a sea anemone. So the anemone protects uh, the clownfish from other predators and at the same time the clownfish protects the anemone. So sea anemones actually have uh, a chemical that they release and would sting most fish. But the clownfish has adapted over time to be able to withstand this chemical uh, so they're able to live in amongst those stinging nettle type things. Uh, pollination in flowering plants is another example of mutualism. Uh, so both organisms benefit in this relationship. So the pollinator, whether it's a bee or any other insect or a bird, receives food in the form of nectar and the plant is able to pollinate because when the bee or the other insects or birds land on the flower, the pollen sticks to their fur or their feathers and then they fly away and introduce that pollen to another plant which allows them to breed. A local example that we talked about on the excursion is lichen. So in this particular relationship fungus provides the lichen with structure while algae undergoes photosynthesis in order to provide food for both organisms. So if the algae wasn't there the fungus wouldn't get food because fungi can't produce its own food. Uh, and if the fungi wasn't there, the algae wouldn't have any structure, so it wouldn't actually be able to form uh, the way that it does. So the next type of relationship is known as commensalism. So this is a relationship in which one member benefits and the other is not affected. So they're not harmed or they're not benefited, which is known as a positive neutral relationship. So in our example we looked at, the elephant stirs up the earth to reveal the insects for the birds to eat. However, there's no effect from the elephant and the birds gain food. Another example is the remora fish and the shark. So here the remora fish is the smaller of the two that you can see in the picture and it's protected uh, by the shark from predators 
and also has easy access to food. Okay, so when the shark eats the sort of food that doesn't end up in its mouth, the remora fish is able to eat. The shark is not affected in this relationship. Obviously, it's quite a great deal bigger, so the remora won't have any impact on it. Another example are ferns and orchids that live on tree trunks in um, forests. So the fact that the ferns and the orchids are higher up in the tree means that they're able to collect water, uh, they're closer to the sun, and also they collect falling leaves. And those leaves provide nutrients for the fern as they decompose in amongst uh, the foliage. A local example that we looked at looked at on the excursion, sorry, was the golden orb weaver and dewdrop spiders. So we saw when we were in the mangroves quite a large spider web created by the golden orb weaver. And then in the corner we saw a small dewdrop spider that was quite a, a significant um, amount smaller than the dew, the sorry the orb weaver. So the the old the golden orb weaver, sorry, is not affected by this relationship, but the dewdrop spider benefits as, again, it's quite small, so it's protected from predators by the larger spider, and it also has access to the orb weaver's food, so uh, the dewdrop spider would not be able to create such a large spider web in order to capture food, so the, the golden orb weaver does that and the dewdrop is able to benefit from it. The next example is parasitism. So this is an association which is destructive or harmful to one organism and beneficial to the other. It is known as a negative positive relationship. An example of parasitism is a tick when it attaches to a dog and draws its blood as we saw. One organism that is usually smaller is known as the parasite and that's the one that benefits in this relationship. The other organism, which is known as the host, is disadvantaged or harmed in some way. So mosquitoes are one of the most well-known well -known parasites. A large number of organisms are hosts for these, including ourselves, rabbits uh, and cows, just to name a couple. So there's two different types of parasites. There's those that live on the outside of the body and those that live on the inside of the body. So ectoparasites are those that live on the outside of the host's body. So we can see in the picture there, there's leeches, also the example that we used in the last slide of mosquitoes, as well as ticks are examples of ectoparasites. So they attach themselves to the flesh of organisms and usually suck on the blood. So they have a sucker or a, protrube, a, a part that will um, push into the skin and then they will draw on the blood of the host. Endoparasites are those that live inside the body of the host. And we can see here an example of a hookworm that lives in the intestines of humans. And what they actually do is instead of the nutrients being released into the bloodstream from the intestines, which is usually what happens during the digestion of food, is that the hookworm absorbs the nutrients and the person suffers from malnutrition as they're not, their body isn't able to absorb the useful nutrients from their food. A local example, we didn't really see one of these on the excursion. I saw a couple when we were walking around, but we didn't really point them out, is known as a gall wasp. So what actually happens is wasps lay their eggs um, on the plant and the tree actually then protects the, um, the egg. So it actually covers the eggs to protect itself, but at the same time it's actually protecting the larvae or the, the sort of the baby wasps that are growing inside. And then what happens is when they hatch, they eat the plant until they're big enough to then fly away. So the plant definitely is not benefiting in any way. Uh, so that's why the wasp is considered to be a parasite. The last relationship is known as allelopathy, which is a positive-negative relationship between two species of plants. So at the moment, we've sort of been looking at mostly animal-animal relationships this is a relationship between two different plant species. So what actually happens is one species, which is usually the larger one, will release a chemical into the soil that reduces the growth of the other species, and this stops competition for resources. So plants need to compete for things like sunlight, water, and nutrients from the soil. So by uh, releasing this chemical into the soil and stopping other plants from growing directly around them, 
the larger plants are going to have direct access to those resources. So a local example that we talked about on the excursion and we would have seen as we were sort of coming down into the mangroves is the casuarina. The needles of the casuarina give off a chemical that stop other plants from growing beneath them. So you would notice if you've seen casuarinas is that there's the very tall casuarina trees and pretty much no undergrowth. Okay, so those leaves are dropped and then as they break down, that chemical is released into the soil and basically makes the soil impossible for other plants to live in. So in that case, the casuarina is able to uh, grow to the heights that they do. Okay, casuarinas grow quite tall and, and that's because there's no competition there for the different resources that the tree needs. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this video. Uh, thank you very much.